everyone, thanks so much for being here. Uh, we are so excited to have Representative Susan Wild, who is the representative for Pennsylvania's 7th District. Um, she is a longtime champion of reproductive rights and health. Um, so we are so excited to have y'all her speaking to you about the importance of standing up for reproductive rights in the United States. Uh, Representative Wild, if you want to take it away. Being here, um, I don't know where you all are and what the weather's like, but it's pretty gorgeous here, and I um, hope everybody's going to have some nice outdoor time this evening. Um, but I am Representative Susan Wild. I represent a district in Pennsylvania um, that is uh, one of the more challenging Democratic districts in Pennsylvania. But um, nonetheless, I am now in my third term, and I'm a member of the House Foreign Affairs Committee as well as the House Education and uh, Workforce Committee, previously known as the House Education and Labor Committee, um, bef before we lost the majority. Um, but I'm just really happy to be with all of you to uh, to speak today. Um, I have to tell you that I'm always impressed when I see people who are taking time out of their day to empower yourselves, um, to bring about change that you want to see in the world. And um, honestly, I can't think of many more topics more critical at this moment than to make your voice heard on reproductive rights. Um, although as I watch what's going on in Tennessee, for any of you who have been watching today, that's a really important issue too, um, the issue of gun safety. But back to this, um, I am a woman who grew up in the pre-Roe world. I went to high school before Roe was ever decided. Um, and in uh, before Roe was actually decided when I was in college, um, and by the time I graduated from high school, I knew the vital importance of being able to chart the course of your own life, which is why I'm such a staunch advocate for protecting reproductive rights, not only here at home, but globally as well. Um, because I grew up bef uh, it, it, before Roe, um, I knew a lot of women who did not have the advantage of um, having reproductive choice, including some women who I didn't know at the time, but I've since grown to know who were in their, they're now in their uh, senior years and have told me vividly what life was like for them in the 40s and 50s and 60s and 70s. So anyway, um, but, you know, we, I know, I know that I'm not telling you anything that you don't know, but it's just so important to recognize and always emphasize that women who have access to family planning um, and contraception and yes, abortion services will have higher educational attainment, um, labor force participation, earnings, all because they are able to control their own lives and um, decide for themselves when they want to start a family. And also um, will be able to make decisions for themselves based upon whatever the circumstances are in their lives at, at that moment in time. Um, this is a decision that I feel very strongly has to be made um, only by a, um, a woman and whomever else she chooses to include, whether it be a healthcare provider, a partner, or somebody else, um, but I don't think that it should be, you know, proscripted by anybody um, who gets to make those decisions other than the woman in question. And I think that it's really important um, to, to know that women have access to important tools and services, um, which right now, quite honestly, here in the United States, in many schools, we already do not have that access. Um, I am a member of the Pro-Choice Caucus in Congress. I'm an original sponsor of the Women's Health Protection Act um, to hopefully enshrine our reproductive freedom here at home. I serve on the House Foreign Affairs Committee and I'm the ranking member on the subcommittee on global health, global human rights and international organizations. And I am an original sponsor of the Global HER Act, meaning the Global Health Empowerment and Rights Act, um, which would for once and for all end the debate, I'm sorry, would end the decades old 
um, gag rule that has prohibited um, NGOs and others in other countries from receiving U.S. health assistance um, if U.S. health assistance funds if they provide, refer, counsel, or advocate for legal abortion in whatever country we're talking about. And um, that is what's known as the GAG Act. And um, it's very, very important that we bring it to an end. Um, so I have, I, I will tell you that it is a mission that I have um, to make sure that women all over the world have the education and the resources and the tools they need to live long fulfilling lives and also to um, hmm. have families um, when they choose to have families and to make sure in addition to that, I will tell you that I think the topic of maternal health worldwide is an incredibly important thing. It, prenatal health, postnatal health, pediatric health and that kind of thing. So I'm working very hard on those. But we know that at the global level, many women still do not have adequate access to contraception or appropriate medical care um, or the ability to access care that would help them with any complications of pregnancy. Um, so it's just really important and critical that we support robust investment in international family planning and um, support the work of the UN Population Fund, which has provided 116 million women and young people with life-saving sexual and reproductive care services. It has prevented 160,000 maternal deaths and it has averted 16.9 million unsafe abortions. Um, and, and so I, I will just reiterate that time and again, the studies have shown that access to holistic comprehensive healthcare always has a positive impact on females' ability to continue their primary education, to pursue higher education, to successfully participate in the workforce and in their community. These are all things that will actually raise up the social and economic conditions, not just of themselves, but entire communities and nations. And it really needs to be looked at that way. When women and girls are supported, their communities thrive, whether it is globally or here in the United States. And so that's why I think the work uh, that you are all doing with Population Connection and each of you who are advocates in training um, is so incredibly important. As a member of Congress, I can assure you that coordinated and thoughtful and relentless advocacy actually does make a difference. I know that it's very hard sometimes to believe that, I just had a town hall the other night on a college campus and I was really trying to emphasize to the students there the importance of their them being very, very vocal on the subject of climate change, which happened to be the topic that was I was answering a question about. <clears throat> and it's even more important than ever in political environments like we are in right now. Um, last year's elections and just this week, the recent Wisconsin Supreme Court election um, shows that rolling back reproductive rights is not something that Americans support <laughs> and that people do have a voice, they must choose to exercise that voice. And we can bring about positive, positive change uh, when we all work together towards a common goal. So thank you very much for taking this training um, and taking time out of your own lives and devoting your energies to such an incredibly worthwhile and important cause. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Congresswoman Wild. Thanks for being here and for all of your good work and for being such a champion of reproductive health and rights for people everywhere. Uh, we are really grateful for it. Um, if you have a few minutes, I would love uh, uh, if you could take a few questions, if folks have them. I'm happy to answer quite, I'm happy to stay until 6.30 after I've got another Zoom I need to get on to then, but I'm, I've got about 10 minutes. Wonderful, thank you. Um, since it's a smaller smaller group of us, us, that is kind of nice, it lets us have more of a conversation. Uh, so if folks just wanna pop off mute and ask the Congresswoman any questions you might have, feel free to do so. If you're not comfortable doing that, just go ahead and drop it in the chat and uh, uh, one of us can read it for you. 
Richard. Go ahead, Richard. Okay. Uh, Congresswoman, uh, I understand that there's a where the big population is really growing is over in Africa. Is that right? In the African nations mainly that's a it's one it's one of several where the population is growing rapidly, but Af African countries are of particular concern because of in many of them there's a lack of access to health care um, and um, contraceptive services and 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 that kind and sex STDs treatment and that kind of thing. So I would certainly say it is a focal point. Yes. Okay. That I was just wondering. I I didn't know. But but the UN supplies them with access to uh, contraceptives. Is that right? Does well, everybody have access to that? Yeah. The problem is, well, the problem is that it's not necessarily that easy um, because of the global gag rule, which um, prevents NGOs and so forth from providing contraceptive and abortion services or oh, even counseling. Yeah. Um, so that's one of the reasons that the Global Her Act that I mentioned before is so important. Um, if it, any any organization that receives U.S. global health assistance um, is prevented from having uh, or from providing information or referrals for access yeah. to abortion services. Okay, what is the uh, situation here in our country? Is the population pretty stable, or is it? Or, uh... um, the population in the United States is actually not currently growing, um, but that is, um, it, it, I, you know, it's expected, it's, it's plateaued, I would say. I, I'm not an expert on that, but um, I believe that um, we're currently in a, a slight decline in population growth here in the United States. Okay. Great, and I just, um, thanks so much, Richard. You wanna just uh, let someone else have a question. So um, Anne Marie has a question. How does the Hobbs decision, uh, uh, the Dobbs decision affect the rest of the world regarding abortion rights and services? And is there a different aspect uh, in regards to the Hobbs, <laughs> excuse me, the Dobbs decision? I'm not quite sure what you mean by the last part, Anne Marie. Do you want to come off mute and clarify? Just well, so you have I, I, I think I understand the question. Okay. I can just say the Dobbs decision is unique to the United States. It does not um, it does not affect the rest of the world, um, at least right now, not that specific decision. Uh, what it the Dobbs decision did was overrule Roe versus Wade and Planned Parenthood versus Casey. So it has returned power over regulation of any aspect of abortion um, to individual states, which is why we are now seeing across the country some states that are enacting prohibitive laws, um, including, um, you know, uh, bans on any type of abortion at even a very early stage of pregnancy. We are currently awaiting a decision out of a Texas federal court on the issue of whether the abortion pill will be outlawed nationally. Um, keep in mind that the case I was just talking about, the Dobbs decision, um, you know, it does allow states that choose to still have um, more um, liberal rules on, on abortion, which would include the state I'm in, Pennsylvania, um, New York, a lot of states like that. But um, the, this Texas decision that we're looking at uh, that should come down any day now is literally um, could um, could block access to the the abortion pill that some people, uh, many people take um, before they even know whether they're pregnant. It's basically the plan B pill. Um, and that would apply to all states, even those with the more um, the more liberal approach to reproductive rights. But as of now, um, the, even the United States Supreme Court doesn't have power over other countries and what they do. However, they could very well have power over any decisions that are made by the US Congress, any legislation that we pass um, that perhaps um, 
might eradicate the, the global gag rule and that's of concern, but that hasn't happened yet. Great. Um, I have a question. It's kind of a, a bigger one, but just curious um, what you would, what you would say to those of us who have been in this fight, in this reproductive rights fight for a long time, and we've been kind of fighting fighting the same battles. Um, I know you said you have been as well. Uh, just kind of what advice would you give, particularly someone someone new on this issue or someone who's been doing it a long time, for how to how to stick with it and just some tactics to keep going. Um, the, the only advice I can give you is to continue to stick with it um, because we have seen that the power of people is pretty significant. There have been changes over decades. I'm now old enough to think back on changes that we never thought would come about um, that have. Um, some things, when, when I was, um, even as late as when I was in college, my mother who was divorced was not able to get a credit card in her own name. Imagine that. Um, so we've changed those kinds of rules. And a lot of that has been because of public outcry. So you have to keep it up. And you know it's frustrating at times. Everybody needs to give themselves a breather when it gets to be too much because it does sometimes. And you need to know when that moment has come and let some other people um, carry the water for a while if you need to give yourself some sort of mental health break some just a break from advocacy but never forget the mission persevere um remember ruth bader ginsburg and um and and um elizabeth warren on the topic of you know uh persistence and just um understand that that you will bring about change and sometimes it's painfully slow um and that's unfortunate but I have seen over and over and over again in my 65 years um, how um, the the advocacy of not legislators, not lobbyists, but ordinary people has really made a difference. Thank you. you I have, have a quick question. question. Go ahead, Grace. Um, could you possibly speak to some of the more recent reproductive uh, rights um wins that we've had that are like outside the regular elections such as the ballot proposals and the recent supreme court like state supreme court election well you know i i'm not sure i'm any more of an expert than all of you are on on what's happening in other states um i was very pleased by the election of the wisconsin supreme court justice this week um and for any of you who, and i her i can't even remember her name i'm sorry to say but um, any of you who have not seen her opponent's um, dreadful speech after he lost, I strongly, his name, somebody knows it, please put it in the chat box. It's worth Googling just to see um, a, a, a really appalling example of somebody who has no grace whatsoever about losing an election. But that's the, the fact that um, the, the woman candidate won there and is very, very, um, it was incredibly important situation because of the, uh, it was gonna change the composition of the Wisconsin Supreme Court. I mean, it was down to whether they were gonna have a majority on the side of women's rights, LGBT rights, and, and many other important rights, including choice, or whether they were going to become one of these unduly restrictive um, states and thankfully um, she won and thank you to Grace who just put the name Dan Kelly which is a pretty common name she also and we also have in the chat box uh, Janet Protaskowitz um, the winner of that but it's really notable um, Dan Kelly's I'm not going to call it a concession speech because it wasn't it was just a really dreadful speech after he lost and um, made, you, made you really realize how horrific it would have been if somebody like him had been elected. Um, here in Pennsylvania, which is where I know more, um, we were very successful in electing Josh Shapiro as our governor this past November. <clears throat> he was running against 
um, uh, somebody from the state legislature who wanted to ban abortion from the moment of conception. The Pennsylvania legislature has been teetering on the brink of um, an abortion ban for years now. Fortunately, we have a very tiny majority now in the Pennsylvania legislature, and we have a Pennsylvania governor who will veto, would veto any anti-choice legislation. We also had a really good governor before Shapiro was elected, who also on many occasions had to veto things that came out of a regressive legislature. So I believe that what we are seeing is that the will of the people um, is prevailing and that the far right reactionary politicians who have some sort of strange mission um, to um, are, are ultimately going to be defeated over the long haul because um, people, yet I, I mean, I don't think it's any secret. People have talked about the fact that the Dobbs decision was probably instrumental in the Republicans not gaining a huge majority in Congress. They did get a majority, but a very, very narrow majority. I can attribute many wins of Democratic incumbents, including myself, in part to the Dobbs decision and the outpouring of reaction and and uh, response to that decision by voters. So, um, so there, I, I do believe there's hope, uh, and more than hope. I believe we we're seeing progress, notwithstanding the fact that there are there is a minority of elected officials who are trying very very hard to take away these rights. But we got to keep it up. And what the work that you are doing is absolutely essential. I see that somebody's dropped a link in the chat about um, about the um, speech that was done, and I also see a mention that the Wisconsin legislature, which unfortunately is uh, not it is Republican controlled, wants to impeach the new justice. Um, that's particularly concerning to me if you're following what's happening in Tennessee today on the, on on gun rights and gun safety. Um, the idea that a state legislature can just oust an elected official who's been duly elected by his or her constituents is terrifying to me. So we've got to be vigilant on all levels, not just at the federal level, but state and local levels as well. I personally, and I'll just digress for a moment and then I'm going to sign off, but I have been um, really working this year. It's not an election year for me, thank goodness, next year will be, but I have been working very hard um, to try to coordinate school board elections and make sure that we are getting school board elections in my district um, on track and that we are electing good slates of people to our school boards, because of course we all know that that's where another, some other very difficult fights are taking place. So what I, all I can say to you is do everything you, you can at whatever level on these very important issues, never give up. Um, as I said, take a break when you need to. Let others, you know, take the 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 oar if you need to, but always come back to it. And with that, I'm going to close and thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you, Congresswoman Wild. My pleasure. Have a good night. Thank you. You too. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.